Thank you for having us. And we're looking forward to speaking with you all about um, a very hot topic uh, related to cybersecurity. Um, and with that, I want to just sort of dive into what we want to discuss today. Okay, so a little bit of background about the th cyber threat landscape. Um, no need to really dive into these numbers too deeply, um, but there are a couple of things that I want to point out. The first is that, as you can see, cyber crimes are on the rise and they have been uh, year over year for the last several years. And uh, the growth curve is only getting steeper. Um, you've probably heard the old saying that uh, it isn't a matter of if your company will suffer a data breach, but when. And I think that statement couldn't be more true in, in today's landscape. So this, this slide just sort of identifies the variety of different attacks um, that make up the complaints from 2020. And you can see that the largest um, uh, portion of these attacks relates to phishing attacks. And I'm sure most of you already know what that is, but um, just as a reminder, phishing and, and other similar attacks are, you know, when you have unsolicited emails, text messages, telephone calls that are purportedly coming from a legitimate company and requesting you know, a variety of information, be it personal information, financial information, uh, logging credentials or the like. And so those, those types of attacks um, are the ones that often lead to the types of cyber crimes um, that, um, that we're gonna talk about today. So um, let's, let's look at a few cases. Um, and some of these, um, you know, obviously are, are ripped from the headlines. Um, things that you've heard about um, um, over the last several several months. And one certainly is the solar winds attack. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about the solar winds attack, um, but mainly I want to identify some some key takeaways for you as in-house counsel and some things to, to be sort of mindful of. Um, this particular attack um, relates to um, a company called SolarWinds, which was an IT management software and remote monitoring company. They developed software for businesses basically to help them manage their networks and systems and information technology uh, infrastructure. And um, the hackers in this case infiltrated SolarWinds systems and they installed a back door into a platform known as Orion. And this was an infrastructure monitoring and management platform tool. This back door that the bad actors um, installed into the Orion platform was then sent to all of SolarWinds customers who used the Orion platform in conjunction with a software update. And so um, the hackers then used the back door to install further malware onto SolarWinds customers' systems. Okay, so you can kind of see where this is going. The original back door that was installed in the vendor's software product provided a front door into all of the customers' networks that used the SolarWinds software. And the targets, um, I mean, there, there were many, many um, targets, both public and private companies. So Microsoft, Cisco, as well as various uh, federal government agencies, um, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Energy, uh, the Pentagon. So this particular breach has garnered a lot of attention um, from the public and the private sectors. And you know, one of the biggest takeaways that you know, we want to offer for all of you is your systems and your network security is only as strong as your weakest link. And sometimes your weakest link is a vulnerability that's created by one of your vendor's products. 
Okay, so from a practical standpoint, you know, as as counsel, you know, we may think that our job is done after we negotiate a vendor agreement, we take a look at the provisions, security provisions, cybersecurity, data privacy provisions, we negotiate good good terms and good provisions in that vendor agreement. That's great. We need to do that. Um, but it's equally important to ensure that your vendors are actually living up to their obligations, um, working with your technical staff, your infosec team, your IT staff to um, audit, evaluate um, your vendor software, test them from a technical standpoint before you let them in and provide them access to your systems. So with that, I wanna take, take a little bit of pause and invite Matthew to offer some comments on this case as well. Well, thank you very much, Samir. Um, that was a great um, setup for what I think is one of the critical issues that we're facing both, uh, both on the cybersecurity side, but also on the privacy compliance end. Um, before I sort of jump in with, with just some, a, few, a few additional thoughts, I, I also wanna thank the ACC um, for having us and thank everybody um, out there virtually or live um, for listening to us, we really appreciate that. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with Samir's assessment of, of this particular attack in the way that it highlights one of, uh, I think, the, the, the most burgeoning sort of issues in the cybersecurity landscape, and that is vendor management. Um, and it begs the question, uh, you know, do we continue to rely on outside support, cloud-based support, software as services, platforms as services, things of that nature. Um, in light of these kind of attacks, this certainly was um, massive, widely reported, and, and broadly impacted both the public and private sector. Um, I, I, I continue to say the answer to that is, 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 you know, we should continue to rely on these services, but to Samir's point, um, the act of vendor management is not simply papering a contract and ensuring you have appropriate provisions. Certainly that is something we want to be mindful about and that should be included in your overall practice. <clears throat> but one of the most important aspects of a proper sustainable organic vendor management program is, is it being active and ongoing. Exercising certain rights that are in those contracts, rights to audit, rights to know certain information about their privacy and security practices, um, even working hand in hand with some of, 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 your, of your major vendors that deal with either sensitive information or are relatively prolific in your, um, in your company or organization, that might require hand-in-hand -hand sort of um, auditing and even security testing, penetration testing, for example, just sort of a technical way to ensure that some of those technical safeguards are up and functioning. What I want to do is quickly juxtapose this particular attack where it's clearly happening on a vendor side that's then being uploaded into other um, uh, uh, organizations, and then they suffered the effects of the attack. Um, yes, it, it is it is seemingly central on solar winds. That's where it originated, but there are so many um, aspects uh, of attacks that we have heard about in the news where um, similar situations have happened internally. So it's really not a matter of whether you are absorbing liability or shifting liability or risk by using vendors. It is simply a matter of being diligent about these security concerns. A great example is the Experian matter, um, the Experian breach. They suffered uh, a massive breach of very sensitive financial information a few years back. And it really was at the crux of it, simply a patch issue. There was a vulnerability and that patch management wasn't observed in the way that it it needed to have been um, that might have prevented such a breach. Um, I only highlight that because it is a similar type of issue where there needs to be constant and ongoing activity, not just simple parameters put in place to ensure you've got the right documents or the right paper down. It's more of an active role. And that could be both in the organization as well as in a vendor uh, or, or a service provider role. The last thing that I wanna say, um, and then we'll move on to some of the other very interesting um, recent attacks as well is this really garnered a lot of attention from the federal government for so many reasons. First and foremost, they were affected just as much as the private organizations were impacted by this. But there's also been ongoing discussion about a comprehensive federal privacy bill that would uh, seemingly encapsulate some security requirements as well. 
So they were quite swift to respond. Um, Congress has been holding several committees of which um, certain senior management and leadership from SolarWinds have attended. And they've really been focusing on obviously causation and impact, but most importantly, and I think something for um, you know what's on the horizon is this is likely going to spur more talk and more action about this prospective um, federal comprehensive privacy and security bill that we've been hearing so much about. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Samir to walk us back through some of the other uh, interesting attacks. Yeah, and, and your comment about active management is a good segue into the next case um, that we want to take a look at which is um, another one that I'm sure everyone heard about, which was the attack on critical infrastructure, um, the Florida water treatment facility. Um, in this particular attack, um, uh, hackers were able to gain access to the, the water treatment system um, used in Oldsmar, which is a city outside of Tampa, and um, we'll talk a little bit about what sort of went wrong to allow the hackers um, into the systems. And, and some of the exact circumstances of the breach are still under investigation. But it's suspected that the hackers gained access to credentials, um, so usernames, passwords, that um, were linked to the Oldsmar water plant and that were a part of um, a compilation of stolen um, credentials from years prior. And then as well as other credential pairs um, of logins and passwords that were um, involved in more recent compilations of breaches. And so these credentials that the hackers were able to get access to allowed them access into the system. And then they were able to take control of the system. And so once they were able to gain access to what's called the SCADA system or the supervisory control and data acquisition system, they were able to increase the levels of lie um, by greater than 100 times the accepted level. And luckily, an employee who was um, mindful of what was happening noticed the change uh, within just a matter of hours and was able to reverse it um, before the effects reached um, the public. Um, however, if this person was not mindful and you know this had been allowed to go on for even a day or two days, it it most certainly would have reached the public with some um, some some horrible um, consequences. And so, um, you know, a few takeaways from here, from this from this attack as well. Um, password management is is critical. Um, you know, when there is a a breach or if there is um, some sense that um, logging credentials were subject to um, a breach, it's only a matter of time before um, you know, those on the dark web who have access to those credentials figure out how to use them to get access to your systems. Uh, it's why having a password management um, program for changing passwords um, quarterly or even even more frequently is important. Um, so that's that's a small thing that you know everyone can do even in their personal lives to to help thwart um, hackers trying to get into your systems. Another important takeaway from this case is, you know, these water treatment plants, the critical infrastructure systems known as SCADA systems, um, they these are systems that have been in place for decades and they really were not built for um, the internet age. Um, but a lot of times they've been um, retooled to provide remote access and access over the internet. And when you do that with legacy systems, um, you are inviting um, potential problems and open doors. Um, you know, this particular SATA system used an old version of the Windows 7 operating system 
for which no more patches were being supported by Microsoft. So just a, a lot of um, you know, first principles of data security um, were not being observed here. And these are things, relatively simple things that everyone can do to, to implement some, some better hygiene for security. So with that, I um, want to see if Matthew has some comments to add. I, I, I want to just highlight that with this particular attack, um, that the effects and the, the awareness of cybersecurity is no longer just about your traditional informational technology infrastructure. It's no longer simply about protecting personal data that you may be collecting, protecting um, proprietary information, confidential information. This extends beyond out now into operational technology. And within that, it could be a, a number of aspects, but the, the, the thrust and the crux of what that means is really technology that, ha that can have a physical impact. And that would include um, uh, information control systems like Samir was describing the SCADA system here has various sensors and ability to control physical impacts within the water treatment facility. Um, other, other types of, uh, of, uh, of areas that may be impacted if you have certain manufacturing um, equipment and technology. If you were suffering from a ransomware attack, for example, you could be completely locked out of those systems and your manufacturing and your supply chain could be at a standstill. Likewise, I do quite a bit of work with the energy and the oil and gas exploration uh, um, um, industry, and they use a, a number of industrial control systems like distributed control systems, DCS, um, and they can have significant impacts on their manufacturing or refinery processing. And so uh, one, one just principal takeaway is that when we're seeing the way this cybersecurity landscape is developing, it is still central on your IT, you know, your, your traditional IT infrastructure, but it is now expanding out into more of those operational technologies, mostly because as Samir said, a lot of this is legacy, uh, you know, uh, legacy equipment being connected in a modern way to otherwise, you know, um, interconnected uh, uh, systems and or the internet entirely. So it makes them particularly vulnerable to these kinds of attacks. The, the, the last um, attack that we'll, we'll cover before we, we dive in some, into some more general principles um, about cyber attacks um, is, is related to an attack that actually happened years ago um, that Home Depot suffered. And really the, the only point of having this um, highlighted in this presentation really is to, is to indicate and remind that um, the effects of a breach can linger for a number of years after the breach actually occurs. So the Home Depot attack occurred in 2014. Um, you know, the, the, the hackers were able to get access to Home Depot's network, um, which ultimately they used to access Home Depot's point of sale systems. And from that, they were able to get customer payment information for you know, over 50 million um, credit cards in, in just a matter of days, um, you know, and, and still back, you know, even though that happened in 2014, as recently as last December, Home Depot agreed to pay um, a settlement to, to, to settle a number of state lawsuits against them. And this is on top of settlements that they paid um, to settle class action lawsuits by the consumers themselves. And so again, the, the, the takeaway here is, you know, prevention and preparation um, are, are super important because these sorts of things linger um, once they happen. So let's, let's dive into a couple more takeaways and then, um, and then we'll switch gears a little bit. Um, so uh, as, um, as Matthew mentioned, um, and, and as we looked um, earlier um, at the types of, uh, you know, attack vectors that are on the threat landscape, you know, we're seeing that bad actors are becoming much more sophisticated. Um, you know, the, the types of emails that I get at work now are a far cry from the, 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 the emails from the Nigerian prince that we all received years ago. Um, they're, they're much more sophisticated. Um, they impersonate folks that you generally trust, high-level officers who, who request information or access to finances on a short time period. Um, you know, it's very important more than ever 
to recognize that and to verify, verify, verify before you provide any information, before you provide access, pick up the phone, call the person uh, who's asking you to do something um, that you know you have a gut instinct about. Um, the other point here is about SaaS systems, uh, software as a service, or you know you can just think of it as cloud systems that uh, Matthew mentioned earlier. You know. I, I, I don't see a world anytime in the near future where companies are going to rely on the cloud less than they are today, right? So we are increasingly going to be reliant on the cloud and all the vulnerabilities that brings into the supply chain. We have to be mindful of that and we have to um, take the lessons from solar winds and, and put our cloud, provi cloud providers and vendors through their paces when it comes to security. And then the last point um, here relates to, you know, what we've all been going through for the last year, which is, you know, work from home. And, um, you know, COVID-19 has really driven IT professionals away in some respects from their, their day jobs and the security concerns that should be top of mind um, and, and focusing more on, you know, getting everyone up and running and keeping, keeping things running um, remotely. And just recognize that, that that lack of focus can also lead to vulnerabilities, delays, and noticing um, things that are happening. And it, it's, it's a reminder to be um, refocused on those issues. Um, as we mentioned earlier, um, there's a significant um, government response um, to all of these things. That tends to happen when the government gets hacked um, as broadly as they did. Um, there are many government agencies involved, including the Department of Homeland Security, uh, GSA, when it comes to you know, defense contracts and the like. Um, and then, of course, the FTC, which is the primary watchdog of of data privacy and consumer rights um, in the US. And um, I think we have a slide at the very end about some of the resources that these organizations provide. The FTC in particular, I think provides some very good guidance that we've identified here. Um, if you just go to ftc.gov, you can download all of these guides and they're, they're really quite practical and useful um, for, for companies to adopt um, better hygiene when it comes to data security. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Mike, uh, Matthew walk us through um, the anatomy of a cyber attack. And be, before I do, I'll just, I'll just say that, you know, we wanna try to discuss some best practices um, for advanced preparation, um, responding to an attack, and generally improving your overall readiness and responsiveness. Yeah, thanks, Samir. Um, and that's that's a good setup because you know quite a bit of uh, of, of what we talk about in terms of um, uh, successfully navigating uh, a cyber incident really does come down to preparedness because in the moment there are so many uh, interested parties and stakeholders involved that it's very difficult to maintain coordination and to maintain a similar goal. Um, so what we're going to start with when we discuss uh, this anatomy section is we'll, we'll start with uh, some preparation work that organizations should be immediately mindful of. Um, but it's not to say that, again, it's a one-time exercise prior to any incident. These are things that organizations should think about in an ongoing and organic way. Um, oftentimes, when we talk about cyber, we are also talking about privacy compliance. They typically sort of go hand in hand. And um, various frameworks like the GDPR um, out, of, out of the European Union really thinks about it in those two ways. And we are starting to see that here domestically. California has passed a comprehensive framework twice now. Virginia just has Florida, Washington are on the precipice. All these, these frameworks have the embedded in them this, this concept of uh, preparation, transparency, accountability, and security in them. And so what I'd like to do is just sort of walk through some of these aspects. I will highlight some of the various legal principles and precepts as we're moving through. We have a section at the end where we talk a little bit about more of affirmative obligations at the outset for security, as well as um, uh, requirements and obligations in the event of a breach. 
breach, um, but I'll try to weave them in throughout, especially as we get to the actual incident. And then towards the end of this section, we'll talk about um, what you do afterward, what's next after that, and, and, and how do you prepare uh, for, for, for the next breach? How do you harden your systems? How do you learn? Um, so with that, we're going to dive right into this and start with, <clears throat> we're going to start with data mapping. And this, again, is a precept that really stems and flows from um, pri both privacy and security compliance. And the thrust of it really is just knowing exactly where your data resides and the quality and quantity of that data, whether that be personal information from a consumer that you collect, personal information from your employees, whether it be proprietary business information that you're generating or even um, confidential information that you have from your business partners or your service providers that you are required under contract to maintain. Understanding exactly where that data is, who manages that data and where it may flow, whether that be within your organization to a service provider or outside your organization somewhere, or even traveling internationally to other affiliate subsidiaries or locations is really critical to know. And one of this exercise is literally coming up with uh, almost like an inventory of, of uh, again, the, the, the quality and quantity of data um, so that you can know in the event of a breach where exactly your obligations may reside because they're different for the types of data that may be impacted. But most importantly, the more you have a finger on the pulse with respect to the types of systems that access various data, the faster you may be able to mitigate and remediate a breach in process. And we've seen things like this, for example, when an organization suffers um, a ransomware attack. Typically, uh, as Samir has already pointed out, they get credentials from unsuspecting employees. They'll usually employ some type of spoofing or phishing scheme where an employee un unbeknownst to them offers up some login credentials, they are then able to access certain areas of your uh, internal systems and oftentimes can then elevate their administrative access so that they are now reaching out into more protected areas of your systems. Um, when that happens in the moment, the better you have a map of where all of your systems are and where all of your data may reside, you may be able to cut them off so that you can stem some of the damage that may be happening. So one very important aspect of data mapping is being able to quickly respond to and potentially mitigate an, an actual attack in the process, but equally as important. It also allows you to understand in real time exactly what kinds of data may be impacted and therefore what your legal obligations may be as these are developing because they can move very, very quickly. A piece of advice here is that organizations of all, all sizes and all kinds do data mapping differently. If, um, if, you, if you're wondering where you can get examples or even some guidance on data mapping, I really do think that the EU has taken great steps in terms of uh, uh, publishing and uh, certain guidance on this type of activity. So you can go to certain data protection authorities in certain EU member states like the ICO, which is the UK's Data Protection Authority. It's basically their, their, their privacy and security regulators. You can also go to the French um, regulators. They're called the CNIL. I wouldn't dare try to say it in French, but it's C-N-I-L. Um, they actually have some good templates for organizations that are just starting out, and they have some good publications and guidance for advice just on this. But from our perspective, from outside counsel, having been involved in a number of breaches, responding to them, both large and small, this is one of the first things we ask for because there's so much of it that helps guide our response, but equally so, there's so much of it that helps from a compliance perspective at the outset. So a next sort of big, again, ongoing organic sustainable aspect of any solid, hard security program is training. One of the most important things that we try to convey to any organization, no matter the size, no matter the type, is that your employees are likely your weakest link here. They are going to be the ones that are going to be the initial safeguards for you against any type of attack, but they are also going to be the ones that can pull the, you know, like the ring the alarm 
sooner than if, for example, your information security team on the back end is reviewing certain security logs and identifying a problem. So training for them, even in the most general way, is so important because it empowers them to understand that I may not know all the technical specifications, but I know when something seems strange and I know when something seems wrong, I know how to react to it. And if I don't know, I know where to go. I know who will tell me more about this. This often comes in the form of avenues or channels or leadership being able to make themselves available. For example, in our systems, in our email systems specifically, it's certainly not the most exclusive uh, um, um, uh, security protocol we have, but Samir mentioned we, you know, we get emails, phishing and spoofing and, and all kinds of emails in trying to solicit all kinds of information, sometimes credentials, sometimes other confidential information. And if we don't know what it is, we don't know who it is, or we identify it immediately as a spoofing or a phishing email, we have an, we have a, an automatic, uh, excuse me, an automatic process where we can alert InfoSec. And it sends that email on. If they're aware of it, they say, thank you very much. We're, we're keen on this. We understand what's going on here. Or it may be something new that they can add to their library. But the only way that happens is if employees know to do that. And so you are training up your employees to be suspicious and to report. That's really that sort of general aspect of what training from a security perspective looks like. That's the broad level. Now, you certainly have in organizations um, uh, a very uh, sort of um, high risk departments. Um, HR is a good one because you're typically collecting a lot of very sensitive personal information about your employees. It could, it could range anywhere from financial information with direct deposit um, all the way to potentially health information. Um, and as a result, certain departments may require heightened training or even very specific training, sometimes even uh, broad frameworks like HIPAA, if that does apply to your organization, um, requires very specific training on how employees should access information, should protect information, and how to report if necessary. Um, so that's definitely something you want to think about when you're building your training program is go broad. It's never harmful to your organization to educate your employees on the risks out there and provide them avenues for um, ringing, the, the ringing the alarm if necessary, but then identifying those high risk areas where you can really dive deep with those particular employees, managers, or senior leadership that may have access to otherwise very sensitive information that could be far more catastrophic if there was an event. When you're developing these uh, training protocols, materials, there's often you know, consideration about how often you do it. You certainly don't want to effectuate training fatigue. Um, that's something we're very sensitive when we step in and we help um, our clients develop these kind of programs, but you want to do it enough that one, it's keeping top of mind for these employees, the, the various cyber risks, but also you're staying abreast of, of ever developing um, risk awareness. Um, the threats change and shift constantly. And so it's, it's imperative to maintain uh, at least some type of cutting edge training material that you're telling your employees about, not from just a historical perspective, this is what we have seen in the past, but this is what we might think about seeing in the future as well. Um, one thing that we haven't necessarily mentioned, but I want to do it here because we're talking about how you effectuate training, um, cyber risk is not exclusive to large organizations. It, 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 it it, it, is, it, is, it impacts both large and small, both public and private and all types of companies. And as a result, you know, some small organizations may not have the type of resources um, to really dive deep and build an internal information security or cyber risk program like we're talking about today. And that's okay. Um, the idea though is just to make sure that you're really getting in there and you're staying proactive. And one way a small organization can do that is really leveraging outside consultants. And there's a variety of them. Certainly you have outside counsel that you can rely on from a, a risk and legal perspective, but there's also organizations that do just very basic training um, in, in either a sort of a computer-based way, in a live way, or even other um, more creative ways like tabletop exercises, um, which we'll get to in just a moment when we talk about incident response and preparedness more generally. Um, but that is a consideration, especially for organizations that don't necessarily have all the internal resources to continuously move forward on the training front. I want to cover um, uh, this, this, this slide on infrastructure and audit, and then I want to um, ask Samir if he's got any few comments about what we've just covered. But 
really kind of coming into this, you may be thinking, you know, as, as, as legal counsel, my role is largely going to be um, from, from, the, from the back end of things from a cyber perspective. And, and, and I would like to just from, from the outset say that is not true. The, the, the more engaged legal can be in this overall process, the better off your organization will be from a risk management and mitigation standpoint. Yes, it's true that um, your infrastructure will largely be built by your information security teams and your, in, and your information technology teams, but they are down there doing the day-to-day -day work to protect those systems, make sure they are hardened, make sure that they are constantly updated and monitored. But from a risk management standpoint and, and an overall compliance posture, legal is critical to this environment. And putting together various programs and policies that support information security, that support your IT personnel is critical. You need to know what your active ongoing compliance obligations are from a security perspective. You also need to know what your risk looks like, and that may require you to understand from a contractual standpoint what your obligations may be to your business partners, your regulators, your service providers, what your risks are internally if you ever had a breach of confidential proprietary or even personal information. And as a result, that's going to drive how often you may audit, for example. Uh, you may do some extensive auditing given the infrastructure that you may have, given the risks that are posed to your particular business. But that is really going to rest not just with information security and IT, but certainly legal as well as business. You, you're going to work in coordination to understand what those risks are and develop a policy and program to try to mitigate those risks as best as possible. I want to just pause here. I'm also trying to be very mindful of our time. We've got some dense material to go through. But Samir, do you have um, any just comments to make on those three topics? We've yeah, I, the only thing I'll say, and I, and I also want to make sure we're mindful of time, is um, I, you know, there's a lot we're covering. And um, it can seem daunting. Um, it can seem like, well, gee, where do I even begin? Um, and what I will tell you is, there are small steps that you can take that will make big, immediate impacts. Um, you know, you you could start with just bringing in a, an outside um, um, trainer or or engaging a vendor to to provide um, online training for your entire um, workforce. And some of the online training I've seen is fantastic at helping employees understand how to identify a phishing email. Um, you know, if, if that's all you're able to accomplish, I mean, think back to that first slide or first couple of slides, 50% of the cyber threats are related to phishing emails. So you can do a lot of good by, by just taking some small steps. Um, and I would encourage you to do that. We also have a, a password management program at our firm where every you know, a couple of months, we have to change our password. You know, steps like that will eliminate or at least help reduce advanced persistent threats um, where hackers are in your system for a long period of time and, and sort of getting a lay of the land and figuring out what they can do. So there's small measures you can take um, that will help quite a bit. And so with that, Matthew, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. And, and we do have quite a bit of material to move through. Yep. So I'm going to, uh, for the folks uh, for the folks out there listening to us, I'm just going to speed up a little. Um, you're going to be able to take these slides home. We've got a lot of good information in here, but I'm just going to hit some high levels because there are certain aspects that I'd like to dig in just a little bit more. So the next one is um, insurance. This is something that's actually been, uh, you know, on on the table for discussion for, for, for many, many years. Um, I've worked with a number of clients that have and have not had cyber specific insurance. Um, and I will tell you that it is quite helpful um, from the perspective of um, you know, consideration of costs, obviously, um, as you're moving through. It's not necessarily something that is drawing your attention away, something that is constantly sort of pinging you or, or, or even preventing you from responding in a defensible way. Um, cyber insurance is definitely going to be very, very much dependent on your policy. It's typically excluded from your general, um, your, your sort of general coverage. So just be mindful of that and work with, you know, any your, of your preferred carriers. The one thing that I would say about cyber insurance is that oftentimes if, if you do get coverage from a cyber specific policy coverage area, 
Um, your insurance carrier may require you to do some of these things we're talking about, you know, ensuring that you have some of these proactive measures in place and you have a robust cyber program if you don't already. Um, with that being said, a number of these carriers also have a lot of great resources to help get you there as well. They are now vested in your success um, from, a cyber, uh, from a cyber risk standpoint. So what is your role here as counsel? Um, we've talked a little bit about it from a pre preparation standpoint, but certainly assuming you've, you've suffered a breach, um, one of the most important things is engaging, um, engaging early with the various stakeholders and continuously. One of the things that we try to step in um, often uh, and early when we are representing clients that have been suffered from a breach is you wanna try to do as much as you can under privilege. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you have legal engagement at that point. Um, certain aspects and, and, and considerations to take on is that legal should be from, a, from, a, from, a, from an overarching project management perspective, legal should really be at the top. They should be directing everybody, including information security and IT um, and others, and we'll get to that in just a moment, um, about what they need to be doing. That's not to say that legal is going to know how to remediate, mitigate, or you know, stop a, a cyber attack. That's information security, certainly, but it needs to be done at the direction of counsel. Again, the goal here is just to make sure, first and foremost, that any response you undertake is done under privilege. As that goes through, you're going to have a lot of different moving parts, depending on the size of the breach. If it's very large, you will likely start to see routine meetings come up so you can have you know, up-to-date information from your information security, from your external forensic provider, if you have one. You'll probably be looping in your communications or your public relations team, and certainly your senior leadership. And if you have a board, for example, you're going to need to be, to be making regular reports to them. Um, having a plan in place up front, especially from legal's perspective, where you are actually coordinating um, this investigation and this response is going to help you leaps and bounds as you're going through that. So you're not caught off guard by trying to figure out what those obligations are. You have them up front. Being able to look to a data map, understanding exactly what might be impacted helps you understand your legal obligations, which may be notifications to various impacted people, um, customers, employees, service providers. You might have contracts that require um, notification. You may need to notify the government in various capacities. Again, being involved early on and upfront will help you understand the contours and parameters of those obligations so that you are not scrambling on the back end. We've talked a little bit about some of these secondary considerations, so I'm just going to continue moving on here just in the interest of time and talk a little bit about your overall incident response teams. You know, our focus right now with you all is about what legal's role is, and it's a very important one, but you're certainly not alone. Um, one of my favorite acronyms, I was representing a client. Um, we often hear it just in terms of like, this is your overall incident response team. You have an incident response plan or policy or procedure. We'll get to that in just a moment. Very important. But um, I was representing a client and they, would, they, they called it their data incident response team, DIRT. And they kept respond, you know, you know, um, uh, communicating that you know, to us. And it's like, what is DIRT? Uh, why are you calling these people dirt? And that's just the, you know, the, the acronym that they had developed for their overall team. But it included um, really primary stakeholders that were decision makers and were empowered, not just with you know, managerial authority or leadership authority, but also budgetary considerations as well. So you had it from your information security team. You, had, you, you have stakeholders from your IT team. Public relations and communications are, are essential, um, especially if you have a massive breach, especially with an, an, a, a large customer base that has been impacted. They are going to be the face of your organization. Having things like um, uh, uh, sort of standing messages that you have just sort of in the pipeline already so that you can, if your website goes down or if you have suffered a breach and it has become public, your comms team are ready. They're not developing something in the moment. They have something that they can respond to very quickly. Another aspect is working with your sort of senior leadership. They're going to constantly want updates on this, right? They're, the business unit themselves are going to want to understand what the overall impact is to the, to the operations, the company itself, and they are going to want continuous updates. So having a coordinated team built upon this overarching procedure, an incident response procedure, um, is going to help you again in spades um, because you are going to know exactly who's in charge of what, who they can go to, and how you coordinate and communicate within your overall team itself. One last thing I'd like to say on, the, on, on this incident response team writ large is that form it early. 
form it early and test on these things. We develop things we call war games or tabletop exercises where we're trying to simulate uh, a very sort of specific tailored breach to your organization. And you get all of the stakeholders, all of the incident response team, all of the DIRT members around that table and you play it out as if this is a live breach so that you know exactly who's in charge, who's going to do what, because there are some folks, IT always means the best, but they want to go off and fix something. And that might not be the right uh, move in that moment. So just having clear lines of communication, uh, you know, clear stakeholders that you can talk to, people who are in charge, who have authority, who have a budget, who have resources, as well as knowing who your external resources are, are imperative. And Matthew, we are uh, at the 10 minute warning, including Q&A. We have talked about forensics. We've talked about breach notification. One thing that I want to tell you about is uh, we're seeing a number of these frameworks come out. I've already talked a little bit about it, where they're coming from. Um, a lot of the security aspects uh, obligations are coming forth through these frameworks, but every single state in the United States has a type of breach notification statute. And even within those, Texas in particular, has affirmative obligations to protect sensitive personal information. So be mindful that you, you not only have compliance obligations at the front, but you also have notification uh, requirements on the back end as well. And, I, and I'll just add to that the point that this is why data mapping is so important because these different state requirements, the GDPR, they, they have different triggers and different requirements depending on the data and who's affected. And right. if, if you're not aware of what data you have um, or, you know, whether it was in a part of your network that was breached, um, you're going to have a really tough time complying with these notice obligations in the very short periods of time that are allotted to you to make your decisions and make your yeah. notifications. So data mapping is another reason, you know, another important um, aspect for that reason. And just to put just to put a, a little bit more meat on the bone there, um, it can range anywhere from 72 hours from identification of the breach up to 60 days, just depending on your jurisdiction. Um, and that is the jurisdiction of the data subject, not your organization. So just be mindful of that as well. Um, I, I skipped over a couple of slides. They're really just about uh, you know overall. Uh, private litigation or governmental investigation, um, basically um, enforcement response uh, to it. I, I think we've all seen enough of it in the news, um, certainly in our legal careers, where we know there's, there's common law liability. We're now seeing statutes that afford private rights of action, and certainly um, state attorneys generals, as well as the federal government, FTC, for example, are really starting to flex their muscle with respect to consumer protection. The last thing that I want to touch on from uh, just the overall anatomy of the breach is at the end, your lessons learned. That is critical. You need to understand exactly how your team did with the response, what the issue was from a technological, administrative, or other types of vulnerabilities so you can correct it, but that you can also build and grow on your overall, your overall response team and your overall response procedures so that if and when it happens from the next time, you will be even more prepared. I'm just going to move through the rest of these slides, Samir, then I'm going to turn it over to you so we can just kind of hit those hot topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good, a good point, um, that information sharing um, aspect of the Cybersecurity Act of 2015 was, was one of the reasons why the SolarWinds attack was able to be um, addressed when it was last December because um, a private company was able to identify this and feel comfortable that they could share the information with SolarWinds and um, with the, the US government. So, so um, very important piece of legislation there. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk a few minutes about some hot issues, some things that you've probably heard of, maybe you haven't had the time to dig into them uh, too deeply. We wanna sort of flag them for you and maybe identify a couple of um, issues for you. Any one of these topics could frankly be its own subject for a CLE. So they are very deep concepts um, or can be deep concepts. And we're just going to try to hit some of the highlights if I can control the screen. There we go. Okay. So um, two sets of security concerns and privacy concerns related to COVID-19 over the last year. Um, the, the first one is actually related to security considerations, the, the, the bottom set of bullet points, which is, as I mentioned earlier, 
you know, a lot of your security staff were focused on other things besides security, um, at least the, you know, when, when we first went to work from home and um, that, you know, it's possible that there have been um, accesses to various networks and persistent attacks are being, um, you know, developed um, as we speak. And th this is mainly a reminder to, you know, just because we haven't seen something happen just yet, to know that, you know, there could be something lurking um, and it's a good time to go back and, and take a look and, you know, make sure that we're deploying patches, we're deploying upgrades to security, we're testing our VPNs, we're requiring um, our employees to follow the protocols, even though everyone's fatigued from, from working from home. The other has to do with um, going from remote and back to reopening the offices. Um, a lot of employers will, um, you know, allow employees back into the offices in conjunction with various health declarations, temperature screenings, um, possibly even checking on vaccination status. Just realize that all of those sorts of you know, pieces of information are considered sensitive personal information. And virtually every single state in federal data privacy law um, puts heightened um, requirements on um, those folks that possess that information, right? And that includes heightened security um, requirements as well. Um, so you need to be mindful of what you're collecting. Um, very good opportunity to practice your data minimization principles, only collect what you need um, for the purpose that you need it um, and, and only give it to the folks that need to know it and only keep it for so long as you need it to, to fulfill your purpose. Those are all very important reminders as we get back to um, the office. Um, won't spend a whole lot of time here. Main point here is just recognize that um, you know, California in the last several years has enacted two major pieces of litigation uh, uh, legislation around privacy, and there are many other states that are following suit, like Matthew mentioned earlier, uh, including Virginia and, and several others that are right on the lip of the cup. Okay, I uh, want to spend a minute on this. So we, we talked about um, the threat vector becoming more and more sophisticated. Um, way back at the beginning of the presentation. And deep fakes, I went too far. Deep fakes are a, a particular way that they're getting even more um, sophisticated, right? So with the increases in artificial intelligence, with the increases in machine learning, it's really amazing um, how realistic um, folks can make a video look or folks can make an, a, a piece of audio, like a voicemail sound. And, um, uh, you know, what that means is you're not just going to receive your phishing attacks in text in an email. Uh, you may start receiving these new form of deep fake phishing attacks with something attached that seems even more realistic and genuine. And be on the lookout for that and just you know, be mindful of, of that happening. And if your gut tells you that something might be wrong, follow up on that and verify, verify, verify. And then the last slide um, we have here is, is, is really just kind of more resources um, for your consideration. Like Matthew said earlier, you'll have all these slides and so um, you can refer to these on your, on your time offline, but um, some, some good resources here, particularly from the FTC, but also NIST who puts out a lot of um, um, security um, um, uh, protocols and frameworks um, and then also CISA. So with that, um, I think we have maybe time for a question or two. And I'm just popping into our Q&A and chat windows. I don't see any. I don't see any either. Um, we looks like we're now one, I guess, uh, 145 my time. I'm, I'm in Pacific time zone. Um, that might be the end. Yes, Samir? Yes, I think so. And okay. so we just want to say thank you again yes. and appreciate your time. Absolutely. It was a pleasure talking with all of you. 
Um, we're happy to answer questions if you'd like to send an email. Um, otherwise, you can curl up with a good slide deck at the end of the day and read through some of the things that we didn't uh, necessarily go over in our, in our presentation today. But we do hope you found this uh, useful and helpful.